Amen. Take your Bible and turn, if you will, to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3 is where we're going to be this morning, and as you're turning in your Bibles there, uh, you ought to know that our senior pastor, Clint Presley, uh, he once again, he won't be here today, but he will be in the pulpit next Sunday. So you be sure to be back here next Sunday as he'll be back in the book of Romans. And if you've gone to Hickory Grove for any amount of time, of course, you know that when Clint Presley's away for a couple weeks, he comes back ready and raring to go. So I'm looking forward to next Sunday. You be here as our pastor will be back now. If you've been here the last couple weeks, uh, you should know that we have taken a little bit of a break from the book of Romans. We've done a three-week series two weeks ago and concluding today. And, and what we've done is we've taken kind of a view of the three major disciplines uh, any believer ought to engage in. I mean, there's more than this, but these three are the most simplistic. And I mean, any child could tell you what constitutes a believer who's walking with the Lord. Well, it's, it's a believer who's reading his Bible. It's a believer who's praying. I mean, my word, it's a believer that's going to church. That's kind of the irreducible minimum. But what we've done in this series is we've taken those three broad disciplines and we've looked at it from another angle. We kind of described it as those forgotten habits of grace. Those habits that are related to those three, but you tend to forget. So first week, with regards to reading the Bible, if you recall, we looked at meditation. That's going to help you get more out of the Bible than just reading it. Uh, last week, if you were here, we looked at prayer. And what's that discipline that's going to help enliven your prayer? Well, it is the most forgotten grace of fasting. And today, we're going to look at going to church. And you might be thinking, my word, Kyler, why did you choose going to church on a time like this, in the middle of a pandemic? I think that's probably why this is more important for us to consider than any other time. Because today, I want you to notice with me the forgotten grace of community. Community. In other words, there's more to go in the church than just go into church. And I pray by God's grace, we will see from 1 Peter the nature of Christian community and how even a pandemic, with all the effects it's had, can't stop it. And so let's, well, let's go to the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 3, if you found it, I invite you to stand with me. And let's read together God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, and I'd like to read down through verse 12. Peter writes, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, uh, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and let him pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Would you join me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, now I ask that you would come both in this room and in all the homes represented online today. And would you take this word and do what I cannot, and that's apply it to the hearts of your people. Lord, I'm asking you to do that to my own heart today. May we subject ourselves to this word, submit ourselves to it, sit under it, be mastered by it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We were made for more than this. Now, I don't think I need to tell you that. These are abnormal days. We have traded uh, gathering, uh, you know, gathering firsthand. We've traded that for, you know, church on demand. We've traded communing in our Sunday school for Zooming in our Sunday school. And I'll, I'll just say, as an aside, I thank God for all the Sunday school teachers who have labored throughout this pandemic to do all they can to keep Sunday school classes connected. It is no easy task to trade communing for Zooming. It is just flat not the same. We have traded, you know, trying to cultivate social intimacy within this body for trying to cultivate counterintuitively social distancing in this body. I mean, it is just one bizarre time. Now, having said all of that, I am not here today to tell you the obvious. We all know that we were made for more than this. Here's what I want to draw your minds to. You ready? The truth of the matter is we were made for more than just this. We were made for more than that. And by that, I mean pre-pandemic. I'm talking mid-March. I'm talking February. 
I'm talking 2019. We were made for more than that. Now let me tell you what I mean by that. I trust that if you become a Hickory Grove for any amount of time, you, have, you know a few things. You know what to expect. You, Lord willing, have high expectations. When you come to church, you know, my word, Kyler, this is the body of Christ. This is the bride of Christ. The Bible calls this the family of God. I'm a part of the flock of God. Your expectations are rightly high. But do you ever find your experience not meeting your expectations? In other words, you come into this body of Christ and you feel like the appendix. Well, you're there, you're a part of the body, but nobody's quite sure what you're good for. And you might be wondering, my word, I don't know what role I could possibly play in this body. You ever find yourself coming into uh, the bride of Christ and knowing that you should behold its beauty, but all you can do is fixate on the blemishes? And as you just fixate, you start, to, you start to lose that love and luster for this church? You ever find yourself, I'm part of the family of God, but I feel frustrated. I just don't feel like I'm part of the family. I feel like I'm on the outside. It feels like Thanksgiving every Sunday. We just don't have a lot of commonality. Or maybe you come into the flock and you just feel forgotten. You're that sheep that got left way back there. And there's just maybe in this season in particular, you find yourself just, my word, what would God have for me in this season when it comes to the grace of going to church? Because you, for many of you, you can't be here. And for those of you that are here, I mean, my word, it's kind of hard to have real Christian fellowship when you're all spread out. If you're that person, I want to speak to you today. I, in fact, I want to speak to three different kinds of people. And I have a feeling one of us will land in one of these three categories. I want to speak to those of you today that are disappointed. Meaning you naturally have high expectations and your expectations are routinely not met. I want to speak to you who are, uh, let's just use the word disinterested. You have low expectations, which means your expectations are always met. And you're like, I don't care what happens here, there, anywhere, whatever you do what you do. I also want to speak to those of you that you could just describe as distracted. Those of you that may not have any expectations at all. You just, ah, whatever. I want to speak to all three kinds of folks today, and here's what I want to do. I want to call you to see with me anew. I want you to see your role in this body, even in the midst of a pandemic. I want you to see your identity in this family of God. I want you to see your function in this flock. Indeed, I want all of us with new eyes today to behold anew the beauty of this bride of Christ. And here's how I think We'll do it. I want you to see that when Christ calls us to church, he calls us to way more than just going to church. I want you to see the forgotten grace of community. In fact, let's just, let's just say it like this. When Christ calls us to church or to congregate, he is calling us to community. Now, I'm not making that up. That's not just a pop word you use this day and age. This is as old as the book of Acts. When you go read where the church first began, what do you notice? You're going to notice as early as chapter 2, it says all the believers, they were uh, dedicated to the word, to prayer. And then this third word, koinonia, which means fellowship. What is he talking about when he says fellowship? That word fellowship, that word koinonia, it's talking about this real robust commonality, uh, this partnership. Let, let's frame it like this. He's saying, I'm not calling you to be a club. I'm calling you to be this supernatural community. There's something unique going on when koinonia happens within the body. This is the sort of thing that was practiced by Jesus. Not only when he washed his disciples' feet. I mean, you would have never expected the high Lord to do that. But then right after he washed his disciples' feet in John chapter 13... He makes a declarative avowal. In John 13, verse 35, he says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples. If you go to church, if you read your Bible, if you pray, the text says, if you love one another. This is the spirit of the Apostle Paul, who when he wrote to the church at Thessalonica, which by the way, we're moving through the two epistles to the church at Thessalonica, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, in our pastor's class on Wednesday night. If you're interested, join us at Streams Online at 6.30 every Wednesday. 
And you're going to notice that the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to that church in chapter 2, verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians, just listen to how Paul talks and wonder if this could ever be you. He says, being affectionately desirous of you, we're ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very selves, because you have become dear to us. Man, that is some strong language. That is the spirit of koinonia, practiced by Jesus. This was patterned by Paul, and I want you to see it is prescribed by the Apostle Peter, which is why I'm turning your attention this morning to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. If you read, and we don't have time to go read through all this, but if you notice, in 1 Peter, he starts in chapter 2 by talking about how believers should interact before unbelievers. He gives this description on how you should interact in your home, how you should interact in the government, how you should interact so that a watching world can look in and see there's something different about you. But then in chapter 3, verse 8, he changes his tone, and he has a word for those of us who follow Christ and interact with other believers in the body. And he says, let me say a word to you about how we must hold ourselves in the body of Christ. And so today, I want you to see in this text that Peter prescribes, let's just say it like this, three broad ways you and I can cultivate community. How we can convert this church from just a congregating crowd to a compelling community. From a superficial fraternity, and it's easy to fall into that, and to genuinely a supernatural fellowship. And I want you to feel uh, the onus on you. I want you to see that I think Peter is doing this. I think he's showing us three ways that you can cultivate community. Not your neighbor, not your spouse, not the person on the other side of the room. I want you to hear the Lord speak to your soul today and say, these are three broad ways I can contribute to this body of Christ and cultivate genuine Christ-like community at Hickory Grove. And so if you're taking notes, I want you to mark this first one down. Number one, mark this down. You and I, we ought to consider our commitment. And I want you to notice with me in verse 8. In verse 8, he lists out uh, five different attributes or five different characteristics or five different virtues. Let's just put it like this. I think he lists out five different commitments that we as believers must have when we come into the body of Christ. Because I, I want you to notice this distinction. If we lack these commitments, what you're going to find is you're going to find yourself in a church that, for lack of a better word, you could describe as a natural community. A natural community is one that the gospel is not necessary. In other words, you tend to be with the people you like, the people who have similar tastes and interests to you, the people that look like you, talk like you, act like you. That's a natural community. It happens all across the country. Uh, you see this in like workout clubs. You see this in different social settings. You just see this in your friend group. That's a natural community. And what I want you to see is Peter's calling us to a supernatural community. And let's define it like this. That's the kind of community that doesn't make sense. If somebody were to come in these doors, they'd say, man, I am, it's unusual for me to see somebody in their 80s sitting next to somebody in their 20s. It's unusual for me to see somebody who's socioeconomically so uh, wealthy sitting next to somebody who is not. It's countercultural for people to come in and say, this, this just doesn't make sense. What is going on in this community? This is what the Apostle Peter is calling us to. Five different attributes or commitments we must have. Now, I could just read them off to you. You guys can read. You can look at those, and they're kind of self-explanatory. What I'd like to do is frame them in a little bit more thought-provoking way. So I hope you have steel-toed shoes on. It may feel like it's stepping on your toes. Rest assured, it's stepping on my own. If you feel like I'm pointing at you, I'm pointing right back at myself as well. These are things we must grapple with together. And so let's look at these five different commitments we must have if we're going to cultivate community at Hickory Grove. First off, mark this down. We need to be committed to unity over uniformity. Big difference. Unity over uniformity. What's that first phrase? It says, finally, all of you have unity of mind. That word in the original language is homophrones, which means same mind. Literally, same mindset. Think alike. Now, let's stop for a second. You hear me say, think alike. When you think of having unity of mind, what, let's be honest with ourselves. What do you mean? When you say we should be unified, what you mean is you need to think like me. <laughs> we're prone, we're prone to uniformity. 
We're prone to think that when we come into the body, everybody probably ought to have a personality similar to ours. You know what? You need to think how I need to think. By the way, that happens uh, every marriage in the first year discovers that that flat doesn't work. In my role, I do a lot of premarital counseling, and I bang on this more than anything else. Remember, if you're going to seek uniformity, you're going to be in a jam, and you'll be back in my office in a year from now. Remember, Paul is not calling, Peter rather, is not calling us to uniformity in personality. Moreover, he's really not even calling us to some sense of uniformity uh, in practice. In other words, you do as I do. I mean, that's what you call a cult, everybody. A body doesn't work that way. My hand has a different function than my foot, and it should be. There are different ways or different practices each of us are going to have within this body. We're prone to uniformity, and what he's calling us to is he's saying, no, 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 I'm calling you to unity. Now, what does this unity look like? How does it distinguish itself? I would say it's unity in mindset. In other words, we have the same starting point. And that starting point is the gospel of Christ. One of us isn't starting over there and one of us isn't starting back there. We're all on the starting line together. We have agreed on these fundamental, essential core issues. The gospel is the great common denominator that unites each of us. We have unity around the gospel. It's a unity in mindset, but it's also a unity in mission. In other words, it's not enough for us just to stand at the same starting point. We got to be going the same direction. We can all start here and I can turn around and go that way. We need to have our eyes on the same horizon. We need to be going together. But let's stop for a second. Does that mean we all need to walk at the same pace, with the same gait, the same stride? No. Unity does not mean uniformity. We're going to go at it differently. We're going to be all going in the same direction with the same core values, the same mindset and mission, but some of us are going to be different. So let me just plead with you. Commit to unity in mindset, not mind. We can have different lanes to run in. We're going to be different. Commit to unity in mission, but not method. We're going to have different ways of going about this. Nevertheless, Paul, I keep saying Paul, Peter says, we've been in the book of Romans a long time now. Peter says, you and I, we must cultivate, indeed we must commit to unity over uniformity. But he has another word. If you'll notice in the next word, he says to sympathy. Now, I want to frame it like this. We need to commit to sympathy over pity. That word sympathy is important. In the original language, this is important for you to hear. It's sum pathes. That word sum means together. Pathes kind of reminds you of the word pathos. It means to feel or to suffer with. In other words, to have sympathy is not just to feel bad. To have sympathy is to actually feel or suffer with somebody. And here's the truth. We're prone to just feel but not with. In other words, I would describe it like this. We're prone to pity. Have you ever found yourself being willing to listen but not linger? Have you ever found yourself being prone to feel bad but not burdened for another believer? The emphasis Peter gives us is not just on the feeling, in other words, just having normal human emotions, that a regenerate heart is not required to have those emotions. He's saying we must feel or suffer with. There's that sum, with. And how how does that work? Well, this is why I think Paul in the book of Romans chapter 12, we've been in the middle of this, we'll be back in it soon. That's why he calls us to rejoice with those who rejoice. He calls us to weep with those who weep. When he wrote his letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, if one of us suffers, we all suffer. Now, what if you're not like that? I mean, candidly, I'm not the most sympathetic person. I have to really conjure it up sometimes. What if you're not prone to it? What I have had to do for my own soul time and time again and I encourage you as well, dear brothers and sisters, is that you must give yourself to reflecting on the sympathy Christ has had towards you. Consider the extent to which He has felt what you have felt. He has suffered what you have suffered. He is indeed a great high priest who is totally aware of all of our weaknesses. He knows the frailty of humanity, and yet He has sympathy towards 
us. And then ask the Lord to help you see others in this church through those lens. And if you do, if you can commit to sympathy over pity, watch, watch, watch your experience on a Sunday change. If you're not here physically, right now I would encourage you to consider somebody you know who is suffering. There's a great many that are. And you've been, you've been kicking it down the road for some time now. Today, after the sermon is over, you send a text message. Call. Send a note. If somebody is really grieving, they need some kind of help, go get DoorDash. I've never done it, but I heard it's useful. Have a meal delivered to their house if you don't want to drive over there yourself. These are elements of sympathy, feeling with one another. That's the second thing I want you to see. We must commit to sympathy over pity. Now I want you to see this third thing, and I didn't tell you this at first, but in the original language, as you're looking at these five things, there is a feature in the original language that we English speakers don't really ever pick up on. There is a structure. It's called a chiastic structure. It doesn't really matter if you know that. Here's the, the picture. It's like climbing a mountain. When you climb a mountain, you start at the base and you go up to the summit, but what goes up must come down. And this is what's happening in the text. It starts with unity at the base, and then it builds to sympathy, and then it builds to the peak, which is brotherly love. And then we'll get there in a second. You're going to notice we're going to go downhill because the next word, tenderhearted, is a whole lot like sympathy. And the final word, humble mind, is a whole lot li uh, like unity of mind. This is that structure. So the point is, Peter's main point is number three, what we're looking at right here. So don't, don't miss this one, brotherly love. Let's frame it like this. Uh, we need to be committed to family over familiarity. You see that word brotherly love? It's where we get the word Philadelphia from. Uh, brotherly familial affection. And if you've got a brother and that doesn't bring you to a real warm place where you're like, well, I don't have a, the greatest love in the world for my brother. I want you to think about the family dynamic here. This is probably what Peter was doing in relation to his brother Andrew, who was one of the disciples. He had this affection for his brother Andrew, and he's saying, as a church, we must love each other like you would love a family. Now, we're prone not to do that. We're prone to familiarity, right? I mean, I'll admit, even as as a pastor, it's easy to do this. You're prone to kind of the surface level, superficial. You kind of love other people more like a stranger than as a true sibling. In other words, the loving things that you might be prone to do for somebody seated on your row. I mean, if you're a believer, you'd probably do that for anybody you run into anywhere in society. And Peter is calling us to more. He is saying... The commitment we must have to one another must far exceed what you would naturally be prone to do for your neighbor or for your coworker. He's calling for something unique. He's calling us to be a family. Now, let's just stop for a second and remember, when you're in a family, you don't get to choose who's in your family. There's always going to be that uncle. There's always going to be that sibling that you just are naturally more prone to kind of be graded up against. You don't get to choose who's in your family. Moreover, you really don't get to control your family, do you? As much as you'd like to, you can't always control what's going to be said and done. So just remember, there's going to be a time where you're going to get hurt. There's going to be a time where it's just not going to work out the way you want. Remember, remember, remember. We are called to brotherly love. And I would encourage you to just mark this down. If you need a phrase to kind of, how do I do this? How do I love somebody at Hickory Grove differently than I would love just anybody else? Here is the kind of love that I think Peter's calling us to. I have no other way to describe it but to serve sacrificially. To serve sacrificially means it's going to cost you something. It means it's not going to be something you naturally be inclined to do. Our, who amongst us is not more naturally inclined to sacrifice for our child or our parent than you would be just for some random person? It's just part of our DNA. You naturally are inclined to sacrifice for your family. And Peter is calling us to this in the body. We must uh, commit to family over familiarity. That's number three. Now let's go down the hill a little, and you're going to notice stark similarity. Number four, I want you to see that next word, and that word is a tender heart. Let's, let's frame it like this. We need to commit ourselves to compassion over convenience. Now, that word, uh, tender heart, in the original language, it is important for you to understand it. The word is bizarre, kind of how, hard to pronounce. It's you splunk noi. B 
bizarre, but here's what it means. It means a good feeling in your gut, in your, I mean, literally in your bowels. He's saying, hey, brothers and sisters, we got to have good bowels, bizarre. What is he getting at? I think we, we're familiar with this language because who amongst us has not said, I got a gut feeling? Who amongst us has not said, you know, I've just got this feeling in my gut? Uh, or if you come up here and you're a little nervous, you're like, I've just got butterflies within. That's because in the original uh, Greco-Roman world, it was natural for them to associate deep feelings with the core of your body, your, your gut, your intestines. And what Paul is... Uh, Peter is saying is he is calling us to say, you need to have a deep concern in your guts, a deep emotional concern for other people in your church. Not superficial, deep. Now here's the trick. I am prone, and I trust many of you might be as well, I'm prone to convenience. And here's what I mean by that. I'm compassionate when it's convenient. <laughs> I, uh, I care as long as it's efficient. But if I get too busy in time, you know, it's like, well, man, I really don't have time to, to meet all this, the needs here. Or I can be prone to compassion when it's easy, meaning I can reciprocate. I've, I know what you're feeling because I've done this before. I've been through this. Those are easier. It's when compassion is required and you don't have as much time. Or compassion is required and you honestly don't really know what they're going through. You, you've never been through anything like that before. That is where, brothers and sisters, we must remember we have not been called to convenience. Paul says, if you want to see a church have genuine Christ-like compelling community, you must commit yourself to a tender heart, to compassion. Let's think about Jesus, who I think is the greatest exemplar of Christ-centered compassion. Indeed, he was the Christ. He had compassion in the face of sin. That's why he put on flesh and dwelt amongst us. And that's why Hebrews tells us he was a great high priest who can sympathize with our weakness. When he comes before sinners, what does he do? Again and again, it says he has compassion on those who are in sin. Jesus demonstrated compassion in the face of inconvenience. If you go look in the Gospel of Matthew, you're going to notice a story in uh, uh, chapter 14 where Jesus was kind of inconvenienced and he wanted to get out by himself. But as he got out by himself, he ran into this crowd and instead of being annoyed by them and trying to get away further, it says he had compassion on them and returned and came to them and cared for them deeply. This is the sort of compassion Jesus had in the face of innumerable cases of suffering. If you, almost, if you go read the Gospels, almost every miracle in the New Testament involves the word compassion, where Jesus had compassion to one degree or another on these people. He brought compassion with him. And so let's just take that home to ourselves. A tender heart, if you want to know what that even looks like for you in this body, a tender heart is quick to forgive sin. A tender heart forsakes convenience. A tender heart finds those who are suffering. You don't avoid, you run to it. In this age of pandemic, it might mean that you are consciously praying for, dwelling on, and reaching out to those you know are at a rougher point than you are. You are running to those who are suffering, and you are bringing the compassion of Christ to them. Brothers and sisters, if you commit yourself to compassion over convenience, watch compelling communities start to be cultivated within this body. That's the fourth thing. And let's look at the fifth and final characteristic or commitment we see in verse 8 in this text. The fifth thing I want you to see is that word humble mind. And let's frame it like this. We ought to commit ourselves to deference over preference. And here's what I mean by that. That word humble mind, it means exactly what you'd expect. It means humility. And the truth of the matter is, most of us aren't prone to that. We're, we're prone to preference. We actually come into um, most settings, whether it's the church or otherwise, and what do you want? You, you kind of want things to be the way you would want them to be. How many of us, and my word, I am chief amongst you, how many of us are prone to really want our own interests to be chief? And Peter is saying, if you want church to be more than church, if you want to be a part of a genuine, compelling community, you must do as Paul called us to in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others as important, more important rather, as yourself. 
Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but you ought to look to the interests of others. And so what could a, what could a humble mind look like in this body? Well, for one, I think it would be a, a charitable mind. Now, that's somebody who gives the benefit of the doubt more naturally than to the contrary. Uh, moreover, a humble mind would be a considerate mind. That's somebody who is more concerned about others. Now, having said all of that, you may be thinking, Tyler, that is good, and I like that, and I wish I could be that way, but what if other people in the church don't respond in kind? What if I demonstrate this humility of mind, this tender heart, this brotherly love, this sympathy, this unity, but I don't get reciprocated with? This is where you must see the second broad way we must cultivate community. And we're going to see this in verse 9. Number two, mark it down. We need to consider our conduct. You need to consider your conduct, not just your commitments, because take it to the bank, somebody's not going to respond in kind. And what are we prone to? We're prone to what verse 9 says. We're prone to repay. So in other words, if we get uniformity thrown at us, what do we naturally do? Do we respond with unity? I don't. I am naturally, my flesh is inclined to, oh, you're going to just make sure things are your way? Well, let me show you what I want. You respond, you repay with uniformity. Uh, You're met with pity and you respond, not with sympathy, but with pity. Uh, You're met with familiarity, like, well, you don't really care? Okay, well, I'm not going to really care in response. You repay with that. In other words, that word repay is render as due. Yeah, you know what? If you're going to do that to me, I'm going to naturally do that to you. Truth be told, My word, all of us in this room, myself amongst you, we are prone to conditional love. Man, if I'm getting these things, I'll gladly reciprocate. But if I don't, my flesh wants to repay. And Peter is saying, no, the believer in the local church must be marked by unconditional love. Look with me, if you will, at verse 9. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't repay reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, do something else. So let's stop. We're going to look through this whole text. When he says, don't repay evil for evil, Peter is saying, hey, brothers and sisters, watch, watch, watch what you do. When somebody doesn't respond to you in the way you think they ought to, be careful what you do. Don't respond with evil for evil. But he adds another layer. He says, don't just watch what you do. Watch what you say. Because he says, don't repay reviling for reviling. That's that that's a hateful speech or just saying something that's not too nice. Now, here's what I really want you to fixate on, because maybe you're like, Kyler, you know what? I, I can control my tongue. I may have thoughts, but I can control my tongue. I, I'm careful what I do, even if somebody wrongs me. I want you to see he doesn't just warn us what to do and he doesn't just warn us what to say. Peter, in this verse, he warns us what not to do and he warns us about what we don't say. Because notice what he says, don't do these things on the contrary, what? Bless. That word bless is, comes from the word where we get eulogy, which is say a good word about somebody. And Peter is say, telling us this, listen, when somebody does you wrong, I am calling you in this family of God not to just simply refrain from doing something back. I am calling you to proactively react with blessing. If somebody says something about you that you don't think is charitable, you don't dig your heels in. You actively respond with blessing. For to this, Peter says, you were called that you may receive a blessing. And we're going to come back to that at the end. Suffice it to say, we need to remember the counterintuitive conduct of Christ. I think one of the craziest things Jesus ever wrote or Jesus ever said that is written down in our Bible is when Jesus declares with words that have rung throughout the ages in Matthew chapter 5, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. My word, there is not a ethicist, there is not a a philosopher throughout history who would have naturally come to that conclusion. Therein lies the counterintuitive conduct of Christ. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Indeed, how much more within the body of Christ. Let's conclude our time now, though, by looking at these last three verses. And we're going to move awfully quickly through these. I just kind of want to give you a taste of them. Number three, I want you to mark this down. We need to remember, uh, consider not just our commitment, as believers. We need to remember or consider not just our conduct. Number three, I want you to consider with me where your confidence lies. 
Because the truth of the matter is, you could take a sermon like this home and say, Kyler, you know, that sounds all well and good, but it kind of feels like a pipe dream. In other words, I can only do so much. It, it seems that I've got friends who have figured it out. It seems like the community is better over here. It seems like there are other ways to go about this. This might be ideal, but it's not going to ideally work here. And this is where I want to conclude our time. Let's land this plane by reminding ourselves, where must our confidence lie in this body? Three things. Simply mark this down. You're going to see this in this text. Do you notice he uses the word for, and then it's a quote for the rest of the passage? Because what Peter is doing is he is citing Psalm 34, verses 12 through 14. In other words, Peter is doing what any good preacher says. He makes a point and roots it in the Bible. So I want you to see, first off, I want you to see your confidence must, must, must be in the Word of God. Not in the Word of man. There is so much on social media. There is so much in your natural friend circle that is begging you to consider five different commitments. Place your confidence, my friend, in the Word of God. You will not go astray. In the Word of God, moreover, in the way of God. Because notice what he says. After he says, for, then he starts telling you some crazy things. Whoever desires to love life and see good days. Okay, who amongst you would agree with that? I mean, who in this world wouldn't want to have that? Who wouldn't want to love life and see good days? Now, what does he say next? Work hard, make a great living, buy a car, uh, trade it in for a better car, get a vacation home. He, get, he could give all these wonderful things to the good life. And yet he tells you things that would not naturally be your way. What does he say? You need to keep your tongue from evil. You need to keep your lips from speaking deceit. You need to turn away from evil. You need to do good. You need to seek peace. You need to pursue it. In other words, I want you to see, do you want to know what the essence of sin is in the Bible? It's doing what's right in your own eyes. He, the Bible actually says that. So the natural inclination we all have is to say, my way is more preferable than the Lord's way. And I want to call you to place your confidence in not just the Word of God, place your confidence in the way of God. And lastly, lest you leave discouraged, let this be the punctuation mark on the sermon. We must place our confidence in the work of God. Because if you look at verse 12, he says... For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and you today may not feel righteous at all. You may naturally, as you should, associate yourself with the latter half of verse 12, where it says the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And if that is you, bear in mind, the Lord's eyes are towards the righteous, and the righteous are only righteous because of Jesus Christ himself. If it weren't for Christ, we would never stand before him. If it weren't for our confidence in his work on our behalf, we would be for nothing. If it weren't for Jesus, we would have no hope. And so today, if you've listened to this whole sermon and think, I just need to reform myself, I need to be a better person, I need to have some of these you know, better qualities, the call of God to you is not to try to reform yourself. The call of God to you is to say, Lord, if you don't do a work in me and make me righteous before you, if you don't save me, I'll have no hope. But for the vast majority of us, I trust here today and joining us online, here's what I do plead from you. I know, I mean, almost all of you, and I, I know probably a great majority of you joining online. I love you dearly. All of our pastors do. But we pray, we earnestly plead that the Lord would do a work in this church such that we would not just be a mere congregating crowd. We would not just be a mere superficial fraternity. That we would indeed be a compelling community. We would be a supernatural fellowship. And that is only possible if each and every one of us never forgets the forgotten grace of community. And so together, Hickory Grove, let's join in this great effort. Despite the different uh, times we're in, let's do this in spite of this. And together, let's reach out to one another with a heart bent on unity, sympathy, brotherly love, compassion, and with utmost humility for the glory of his name through the ministry of this church. Amen. Would you join me as we pray to that end? And as we do... The invitation to you is if you're wondering whether or not you would ever stand righteous before the Lord, the call of Christ to you today is that you would turn from your sins, that you would trust in Jesus' full, complete work for you. 
And for the rest of you here today, we may need to reassert our confidence in His Word, in His way, and in His work. Would you join me as we pray to that end? Oh, Father in heaven, now come and do this work. We are utterly incapable of looking this way. We need you, Lord, to do in us what we cannot conjure up in and of ourselves. So do it, Lord. For the glory of your name, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with me. Let's respond together in song to the word proclaimed.